Greetings everyone. Welcome to today's lecture on gender and autobiography. In this lecture, we shall be discussing as to how if one wants to study or write about women's history, then one can take into account women's autobiographies and writings. Reading autobiographies and memoirs of women to primarily foreground the personal as political is a very important achievement. This theme looks at the remaking of the household and shifts in power relations within the household. It also reviews how the idea of private and public emerges in the colonial context and in the subsequent periods also. It also takes into account several debates that were part of the colonial question on women. So, a very important theme that emerges in the course of our discussion is that of colonial modernity and female agency as it developed during the British rule in India. Historically, Indian women started writing their life stories only from the late 19th century onwards. It was a complex and a contradictory fact that women's autobiography writing in colonial India was a byproduct of colonialism and several changes and institutions that developed as a result of British rule. This genre had its roots in Western literary and cultural traditions and was born out of a new wave of individualism and selfhood which was the result of changes that were coming about during 19th century. The present discussion will take into account a special article that was published by uh, in EPW uh, written by Indrani Sen. This specific article deals with the legacy of colonial modernity, the social reform movements and especially the movement for female education, women's life writing that emerged as a result of all these changes and how these notions came to be linked with the Western idea of individualism. The writing of autobiographies by women indicated the growth of a certain sense of selfhood and identity. So why we are going to consider an autobiography as part of history? Because Memoirs can definitely be considered as history because any kind of memoir deals with personal testimony and therefore they can be considered as important historical source for studying history, especially gender history, social history and for understanding contemporary conditions. So, Haima Bhati Sain's Extraordinary Memoir deals with the nuances, the twists and turns of a long journey of a woman named Haima Bhati Sain in 19th century rural East Bengal and how from becoming a child widow at the age of 10, she finally became a lady doctor a hospital assistant in the Hooghly Lady Dufferin Women's Hospital. So this definitely captures a very special journey and unless and until this autobiography existed, we would not really have known the kind of life journey this woman experienced. So this autobiography brings to fore several complex and contradictory relations and 
this is definitely one of the most valuable dimensions uh, for, of life that was evolving from late 19th and early 20th centuries for women in colonial India. It also reveals complexity of relations within the family, the diverse forms of gendered oppressions, the negotiations and struggles against patriarchal tendencies in society and also the compromises that had to be reached time and again as a kind of negotiation which Hemavati had to resort to time and again. This autobiography traces the growth of female subjectivity, the exercise of female agency and self-assertion as well as the carving out of an identity in a specific cultural and historical context of late 19th century colonial India. So, the memoirs of Hemavati Sen is very valuable as a source material for the light it throws on women's lives during late 19th and early 20th centuries. It is, uh, it is a kind of a depiction that takes into consideration several twists and turns in the life of this woman belonging to rural East Bengal beginning life as a child widow at the age of 10 and finally becoming a doctor. The memoir of Hemavati Sen, which can be dated to uh, as having developed somewhere between from 1866 to 1932, deals with the story of an extraordinary and unconventional life. After becoming a child widow in the 1870s, Hemavati remarried, studied and finally entered the medical field. So, if we talk about the storyline, so we can say that by the 19th century, the position of women in upper caste society had badly declined and they were subju subjugated. Uh, and also subjected to a wide-ranging oppressive practices. This detailed autobiography is a testimony to several kind of oppressions that women were subjected to. This also deals with some kind of a description about the gendered struggle for education. Although Hemavati wrote her memoir in the 1920s. It remained unpublished during her lifetime. Hemavati's notebook also written in Bengali lay for two generations with her family and finally it came to be translated and published during her grandchildren's time which was almost 80 years after her death. So, Indrani Sen has examined this memoir by situating this memoir within the gendered struggle for education and financial independence that characterized women's struggles in 19th century colonial India and it seems to be relevant till date. So, what emerges is a deeper understanding of patriarchy and how patriarchy had its impact right from childhood and also the whole concept of child marriage uh, considered uh, a specific kind of a role that was to be played by the girl child. Haima Bati Ghosh was born the eldest and the and a, a very favorite uh, daughter of her father who was an affluent zamidar belonging to the Kayastha caste 
in Khulna in East Bengal. Although he was not interested in reform, but he was very much interested in teaching his daughter who was very intelligent. So, he even allowed her to wear boys clothes and also to pick up some kind of literacy and education from her cousins as appears from this autobiography. In contrast, the women folk in Hemabati's family were very traditional and they were not really interested that Hemabati continues with her literacy or educational endeavors. So, it was at the initiative of her mother and grandmother and much against her father's wishes that Haima Bati was married off at the age of nine and a half. So, marriage in the Kulin subgroup of the three upper castes in Bengal that is Brahmans, Vedyas and Kayasthas had to be conducted within the same Kulin subgroup. Right from the beginning, this was a very unusual marriage. Her Kulin Kayastha husband was 45 years of age, twice widowed with two daughters nearly her age. It was quite common to find a huge age gap between widower grooms getting remarried to child brides. Now, the autobiography captures the life of a child bride. Although the groom was a deputy magistrate in the colonial bureaucracy, it did not stop the marriage from being conducted in violation of the minimum age of 10, which had been fixed in 1860 as the legal age of consummation of marriage for girls. The middle aged husband was addicted to prostitutes coming to his room at night and tried to consummate his marriage with a child who had his daughters as her playmates. So, all these facts are captured in the autobiography. Looking back almost 50 years on this experience, Haima Bati wrote, This gentleman, a deputy magistrate, was a person of this sort. For shame, this man is my husband. I cannot put in words the sense of revulsion I felt. So, it was a very frank confession and a uh, Hemavati also uh, uh, mentioned in the autobiography that how her husband made repeated attempts at sexual intercourse and she had to silently face the ordeal. Now, this kind of a description of the life uh, did not stop here and the next phase that she poignantly described was that of child widowhood and how she had to negotiate oppression and resistance. Within a few months of her marriage, the husband suddenly fell ill and died of pneumonia and liver abscess, leaving Haima Bati a child widow at the age of 10. Initially, her mother-in-law called her uh, an evil influence who had eaten up her son and made the child widow observe very strict austerities, which was the rule of those days. For example, fasting, eating frugally and not properly taking care of herself. Recollecting her feelings of helplessness, Haima Bati recalled, I just lay in a corner. My parents had finished their duty towards me. No one was responsible any longer for this child widow. If I needed a single pious, I would have to beg for it from others. Soon, however, there was some kind of normalcy 
that returned in her life because her mother-in-law in due course of time became more lenient towards her and she was allowed to eat fish and to retain her long hair and did not subject her to different kind of disfigurements that were also a rule that was to be followed by child widows. For example, shaving of hair or dietary restrictions. Haimabati helped out in domestic course and studied in her free time. So, despite all these troubles that had come in her life, she continued with her passion of secretly studying. Haimabati recollected that how her own relatives uh, abused her for killing her husband and their sympathy was more towards her husband uh, or their son-in-law rather than towards their daughter. Several other members of her family, including her mother and grandmother, blamed literacy of Hemabati for her widowhood. She recalled how one relative commented, everybody knew that she would be widowed if she learned to read and write. This was another superstition that was much in vogue those days. Then she also recollects as to how the situation kept on deteriorating when her mother-in-law passed away. Hemabati suffered the typical widow's fate of financial and physical deprivation and dispossession of property. It was at this point of time that Haimabati, being subjected to daily humiliation, like so many other widows, decided to move to Banaras, which was the traditional place of refuge for Bengali widows. At Banaras, she decided to live in semi-starvation rather than accept help. So, she has mentioned in her autobiography that how she was subsisting on only three handfuls of rice with some salt and she even went without food for several days. And for this behavior, she was appreciated for being a virtuous and an ascetic widow. Now, here comes also the issue of inheritance. The widows of Banaras largely belonged to Bengal. The Daya Bhag school of law that was prevalent in Bengal allowed the widow to inherit her husband's property. And since the relatives and the in-laws were eager to misappropriate widow's property, they would subject widows to such deprivation, neglect and ill treatment at their in-law's homes that they would themselves decide to migrate to Banaras, something that also happened to Haimavati. So, widows were cheated of their inheritance by the male relatives and they were reduced to the state of poverty and they were forced to take up refuge in Banaras. Now, describing life in Banaras, widows had access to food in Banaras either through singing bhajans, begging or fulfilling the lust of men. Haima Bati soon discovered that there was no escape from lustful males in Banaras, which also sometimes resulted in unwanted pregnancies, prostitution and a large number of widow suicides that were a norm in that city. So, therefore, uh, traversing through such challenges bravely, Hema Bati now decided to kind of move on and 
uh, she did not give in to the demands of men in Banaras and in fact she has also described poignantly the reality of widow homes. Widow homes were an outcome of 19th century gender reform efforts. The ground realities of such reformist steps were however different. Haimabati also realizes another great truth about being a widow in a patriarchal society that is the sexual morality of a widow was always suspect while it was the men who were the trouble makers. So having discussed all these different aspects associated with Haimabati's life, one can say that autobiography is definitely a very useful tool to understand the realities of past. Thank you.